Good morning. Today is September 19th, and we welcome you to our worship. I'm John Morgan, pastor at Williamsburg Presbyterian Church, and with pastors Rachel A. Bear and Pam Pertzer, we are glad that you have joined us this day. We pray that through this time of song and prayer and proclamation, that you might experience the Spirit of God at work in your life. Uh, we welcome newcomers and children, students and longtime members. We, your presence with us is certainly a blessing. We are also thankful for the presence of our quartet that is going to be leading us in our singing today. The session has made some changes to our in-person worship process. Uh, first of all, there is no deadline for registration. You can register online from Monday through Saturday. Also, while we caution those 65 and older, you're not excluded from coming. If you feel comfortable, you're welcome to attend. We'll also be adding some more musical anthems uh, with choir members and bells at the 11 o'clock. We do encourage you to click and sign the friendship pad uh, online so we can know you that you had attended the service and you can leave us a note there as well. Uh, also, don't forget the Facebook page uh, where you can offer the peace to, to one another on Facebook. Please check mywpc.org online to see our activities, especially as we move into the fall with uh, classes and new offerings that will be uh, there for children and families and adults. In the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, uh, George Sperry died on September 11th. A service will be scheduled uh, for a future date. Uh, please keep his wife Karen and their families uh, in your prayers. Let us worship God. People of God, bless the Lord, bless God's holy name. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love for us. Oh, 
forgives and saves. Gracious and loving God, you live for us. We have not lived for you. You have forgiven us. We have not forgiven others. You have loved us. We have not loved ourselves, nor have we loved one another. Take pity on us and forgive us, God. Help us to forgive. Help us to live for you. Help us to love through Christ our Lord. Amen. of God, our sins are forgiven. God is merciful and gracious and is Lord of us all. Reconciled to God who loves us, let us live and love through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. morning's moment of sharing faith. Our scriptures today talk all about forgiveness, what it means to forgive one another. And while thinking about that in relation to a number of stories I've heard this week, it made me start thinking about how that relates to the idea of a new year, a new school year for many of you. A lot of people in this past week have started their school year, be it in a classroom, or on campus, or just at home. And no matter what, it's probably been a little bit different than what a normal first day in New Year feels like. So that's also probably true of those of you who are going to join us after worship today in our New Year of Sunday School. It will be a new year. You'll see familiar faces, but it's going to be a little bit different. There's another new year, though, happening this week. Our Jewish siblings, um, those who worship in the Jewish faith, have their new year known as Rosh Hashanah, coming at the end of this week. And that new year is all about forgiveness. During the new year, you are to ask forgiveness from those who you may have hurt, even those you hurt without knowing that you were hurting them or that you weren't meaning to. But even more importantly, you are to like take the time to offer forgiveness. To ask people to take care of you by forgiving you. And you forgiving them as well. That's not easy. It's not easy to forgive people. Jesus, when asked about forgiveness, says you should do it. 
at least 77 times. One, two, three, four. Okay, just to count to 77 is gonna take me longer than I have up here today. So that's a lot. But what Jesus is meaning is that you get to forgive constantly. That it isn't something we do just once. So let me tell you a story. I actually read you a story because I couldn't memorize it. Two travelers reach a town. And there's a young woman who has just gotten out of her car. And she has a driver who is carrying tons of packages that she's just purchased at stores around town. But it's been raining and she steps out and realizes that there are puddles deep enough that if she was to step into them, her silk robes would be ruined. So she starts yelling at her driver to help me, come take care of me. And the driver carrying all the packages and realizing if he sets those down in the water, she will also get yelled at, stands there confused as what to do. But the two travelers come upon this and the first one, the younger one, just walks by. He realizes that there isn't really anything I can do. This woman, she's being rude and I, not my problem. The second traveler, the older traveler though, while hearing her fussing at the driver, walks over, picks her up, puts her on his back and carries her across the street and sets her back down. But rather than saying thank you, she shoves him out of the way and continues along hers. So the two travelers continue walking through the town. And after a while, the younger traveler is just really upset and can't be quiet any longer. And he says, that woman back there, she was selfish and rude. But you picked her up and you carried her and she didn't even thank you. The older traveler replied, I set that woman down hours ago. Why are you still carrying her? It's really hard to forgive. It's really hard to let things go. In a world where, how do you even forgive a virus that has taken things from you? How do you forgive people who hurt you, who make you sad, angry, mad, how do you do this? We have to be able to let go. Because that's the other part of the new year. The other part of the new year is the peace that's found in a new start. Whenever we're able to start over, we can find peace and joy where once we held anger. So I wanna to close today with a prayer. A prayer for the new school year. A prayer for those who are hurting, but also a prayer that we all may find peace and joy. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray for schools and communities navigating new ways of learning. We pray for the peace and the joy that comes with new starts and letting go. We pray for the changing seasons and God's beautiful creation. We give thanks for books, libraries, and the gift of learning. We give thanks for teachers, nurses, friends, and family who go with us along the way. We give thanks for you who taught us to let go and to be where we are, loved by you, O oh God, and loved by others. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Please join with me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our understanding that we may receive the word of life. Amen.
Our first lesson today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when he spoke to them. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Beloved, let us now join together in our unison reading of Psalm 103, verses 1 through 13. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Merciful God, I am a man of unclean lips. Yet because of your grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ, I am bold enough to read your word and proclaim your gospel. Open all of our ears that we may hear and believe. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. I'm going to read our passage a little differently today. I'm going to read it, but in addition to reading it, I'll add my own interpretation to it, as well as a little bit of commentary mixed in in hopes that you will hear the ridiculous hyperbole and the gravity of this passage. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. <clears throat> then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Oh, Peter, said Jesus, you really don't get it, do you? Not seven times, 
but I tell you infinity times. It's like this. It's like the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began the reckoning, one who owed him a trillion dollars was brought to him. And of course he could not pay. How did a slave rack up a trillion dollar debt in the first place? His Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and his children and all of his possessions and payment to be made. <laughs> and that was only like a drop in the sea. So the slave fell upon his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. <laughs> everything? There's no way he could pay a trillion dollars in many lifetimes. Yet, out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave the whole debt. Wait a minute. He outright forgave him a trillion dollars and the slave didn't have to pay anything at all? But that same slave was not more than 10 feet out the door when he came upon his fellow slave who owed him $7,500. And he violently seized him by the throat and said, pay me what you owe me now. And his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Difficult, but possible. But he refused. And then he threw him into prison until he could pay the debt, which would be forever because you can't earn any money when you're locked up in prison. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and they reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave. I forgave you all of that huge debt because you pleaded with me. You should not, should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt, which of course would be forever. And Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, so my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and sister from your heart. I really hope that last part is as much hyperbole as the rest of the parable. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peter wanted to make a simple calculation. How often should I give, Lord? Just give me a number. How many times? And Jesus said to him, that's ridiculous. It isn't about keeping score, Peter. If you want a calculation, I'll give you one. Count to infinity. This is hard. I, I wish I could sugarcoat this teaching of Jesus, but Jesus is being really demanding here. And he tells this parable, which is over the top, to be able to shock us and shake us up to really listen to the important message. Now, as a pastor, I have to tell you that Jesus' teaching about forgiveness is one of the things that people tell me they struggle with the most. Well, maybe second most. First is loving your enemies. Second is forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard. There is no doubt about it. But Jesus wants us to know that it is unequivocally essential to the gospel. And this is not the first time that Matthew has made this important point. In Matthew is the only gospel that adds Jesus' instructions to his teaching on prayer. When Jesus teaches them, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In Matthew, Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father. 
forgive your trespasses. Failure to forgive brings great consequences. The message of this parable is that when we don't forgive others, we show how ungrateful we are for the forgiveness that God has so generously given, a debt that we could never pay back. Failure to forgive is failure to reflect the image of God in us, of God's goodness and forgiveness. And the gravity of this parable is to make us realize that our inability and unwillingness to forgive is a sin that separates us from God who has given us so much. It's a turning our back on God. And this failure to forgive calls into question our claim to follow Christ. The consequences are great for us as individuals and for the church. So Jesus gives this severe warning. Jesus knows that this community, uh, this church that he will entrust to his disciples, this family that he has created, that they will not survive unless they learn the hard lesson of forgiveness. His mission depends on it. I think it'd be good for a moment though, to talk about what forgiveness is not. God's forgiveness does not negate our personal responsibilities for our actions. It is not a carte blanche to do whatever we want. Forgiveness is not saying that, that the behavior or offense doesn't matter. In fact, forgiveness is a sign that it really does matter. Forgiveness does not mean that we condone the action that has offended us or hurt us. It is not letting our abuser continue to abuse. Absolutely not. And it does not mean we become a doormat. Forgiveness is not saying that the offense didn't hurt, didn't upset us, or didn't do any damage. But forgiveness does start the 180 degree turn from offense and brokenness to reconciliation. Presbyterian minister and retreat leader Marjorie Thompson writes, to forgive is to make a conscious choice, to re release the person who has wounded us from the sentence of our judgment, however justified that judgment may be. It represents a choice to leave behind our resentment and desire for retribution, however fair such punishment may be. Forgiveness involves excusing persons from the punitive consequences they deserve because of their behavior the behavior remains condemned, but the offender is released from its effects as far as the forgiver is concerned. Forgiveness means the power of the original wound to hold us trapped is broken." End quote. Forgiveness, friends, is at the very heart of the gospel. We proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and to reconcile us to God. That is the gospel. And Jesus' message of forgiveness and us forgiving one another is integral to being a follower of Christ. Forgiveness, when you think about it, is just love. It's love. When we forgive someone else, it's an expression of loving one another as, as Christ has loved us. Forgiveness is twisting the handle on the spigot to allow love to freely flow. I'm not sure that you can love someone that you can't forgive. How many times should I forgive? 
like asking, how many times should I love? Always. In this parable, Jesus teaches us that our practice of forgiving is our acceptance of God's forgiveness. Hear that again. Our practice of forgiving others is our acceptance of God's forgiveness. When we forgive, we are in that act showing our gratitude to God for Christ's forgiveness and realizing the debt that has been paid for us. Now, let me be clear here. God's forgiveness is not contingent on our forgiving of others, but rather our forgiveness completes God's forgiveness of us. In worship, in worship we come every week to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. Every week we return to this act of repentance and like the slave we find ourselves pleading to be forgiven for a mountain of debt. We also, every week, are assured that God in Jesus Christ has forgiven us. And we are reminded and need to be reminded every week in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And we also pray every week, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our assurance of forgiveness becomes realized in us when we forgive others and honor that petition we make every week. I hope that unlike the slave, that when we leave worship, that we do not immediately forget the great debt that has been paid for us, but rather see our forgiveness as an inspiration to reach out and to forgive others. Jesus knew that learning to forgive was absolutely necessary to be a part of the new life in Christ. And I think he knew of the negative effects of unforgiveness would have on the, this community and on us as individuals. Now you, I'm sure, are aware that psychologists have studied the connection between forgiveness on our well-being and psychological health. And there is a direct correlation to those who are forgiving and to their health. And there's also a correlation between those who are unforgiving and the pathology. I, I don't think that's very surprising to any of us. It's not surprising to any of us who have either forgiven and felt that release or held on to that resentment and know of the pain. Forgiveness is good for us because by forgiving the one who wounded us, we release the anger that if we hold on to it would poison our heart. Rabbi Harold Kushner tells of a story about a woman in his congregation who came to see him. He says she's a single mother, divorced, working to support herself with three young children. And she says to me, since my husband walked out on us, every month we've had to struggle to pay our bills. I have to tell my kids that we have no money for movies or going out while he's out living it up with his new wife in another state. How can you tell me to forgive him? And I answer her, I'm not asking you to forgive him because what he did was acceptable. It wasn't. It was mean and selfish. I'm asking you to forgive because he doesn't deserve the power to live in your head and turn you into a bitter, angry woman. I'd like to see him out of your life emotionally as completely as he's out of your life physically. But you keep holding on to him. You're not hurting him by holding on to the resentment, but you are hurting yourself." End quote. We 
can all remember a time when we desperately needed forgiveness. We can also remember a time when forgiveness was refused and the crushing blow that that brought to us and the feelings of how that oppressed our very soul. But I also hope that you can relate to what it feels like to be freed from that burden, that indescribable feeling when it feels like the world has been lifted off your shoulder, when you feel like you can now have a life worth living, when you feel that the relationship that was broken is now moving toward wholeness. I think this parable is about paying our forgiveness forward when we consider how much God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ, we realize it's a debt that's impossible for us to repay. There's a direct relationship between God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others. N.T. Wright says, the point of this parable is that every time you accuse someone else, you accuse yourself. And every time you forgive someone else, you pass on a drop of water out of the bucketful that God has already given you. And one should never, ever give up making forgiveness and reconciliation their goal." End quote. Peter asked, how many times should I forgive Lord, seven times? And Jesus replied, there's no counting in forgiveness, Peter. The one who has really forgiven from the heart doesn't need to count. Amen. <laughs> Join with me in affirming our faith using the words from the Confession of 1967. To be reconciled to God is to be sent into the world as God's reconciling community. This community, the Church Universal, is entrusted with God's message of reconciliation and shares God's labor of healing the enemies which separate people from God and from each other. Christ has called the church to this mission and given it the gift of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, will you join with me in prayer? 
Holy and gracious God, we are grateful for this beautiful day that you have granted us. Sun, wind, leaf, and bird join together in choruses of praise. Loving God, be with us as we engage in the difficult work of forgiveness. Forgiveness is so much more complex, and we hear time and again of our calling to do such work. But we confess that sometimes we would rather cling to the misery we know than embrace the mystery of the unknown. Empower us to come before you, seeking forgiveness against those whom we have wronged, as well as during the times when forgiveness seems impossible. Be with us in this delicate, difficult, and rewarding work. Holy God, we pray for all those whose hands are doing the hardest and most dangerous of work. We pray for firefighters across California and Oregon as they battle horrific wildfires that are leaving many without a home. We pray for those who fought the fires in Greece after a fire broke out in a migrant community, leaving those already displaced finding themselves without a home yet again. Holy One, we pray for all these communities who are suffering, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who are there on the front lines praying for relief. Grant relief, O oh God, dispelling the fires. Give hope to the hopeless and comfort to the grieving. We continue to pray for those whose hands are at work during this pandemic. We boldly pray for a vaccine that is made well and provides healing. We pray for all those in hospitals, wearied from the tiresome work. We pray for places that are administrating tests, handling test results they too do not know the answers to. We pray also for families around the world who are experiencing the continued hardship of physical distancing, especially for those who have not been able to leave their homes over the past six months. We pray for families unable to be at a loved one's bedside as they pass away and for those who are quarantining at home with prayers that no one in the family needs to go to the hospital. And God, we pray for the hands of those who bravely gave of their lives and fought for the lives of others on September 11th. It is hard to believe this tragedy struck 19 years ago, and we can still feel the ripple effects all these years later. We pray, O oh God, for all students returning to school teachers across all ages, and parents who are being asked to continue to fill roles they are unused to filling. May we gather together as a community, celebrating the beauty of learning and new academic years, giving our gratitude to teachers and professors who love their students, and walk alongside parents and loved ones who are providing encouragement to all those participating in these different times of education. God, you alone know our deepest struggles, our worst fears, and our crippling anxieties. And yet, you not only know them, you embrace them lovingly in your hands. We place our lives into your gracious hands, O Lord, praying together the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, as God has so abundantly given to us, let us, too, give in abundance to God.
started, our despite has choked it. Yet look, it lives, its grief has not destroyed it, nor fire consumed.
gratitude for the great debt that Christ has forgiven for us. Reflect God's image as we forgive one another. And now may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you and everyone you love. To everyone who no one loves, may God give God's peace. Amen. Thank you.